be here. It is good to be here with you guys. I am just adjusting a few things here, and now I believe I have you. And this is the first um, this is the first live stream that we have with the classical art homeschooler. Um, on my end, I, uh, I'm excited to I'm excited to talk to you guys um, about all that I myself as an artist have through the years uh, experienced, uh, all that I myself as an artist through the years have acquired, and to pass it along to uh, learners across the country. Um, I'm really I'm really grateful for um, the increasing momentum. Um, I've one of the things that has been really neat in the past number of uh, past number of months is the. Uh, ability to start reaching out to a student base that's not in just my geographic area, but actually also goes abroad. Um, where just uh, earlier today, I was on the phone with a really just a wonderful person, a uh, very nice person from uh, the Midwest in our country. And then um, earlier this week, it was people from different states. Uh, also, I've been receiving emails from people in South Africa, some from India, um, all eager for classical art instruction. Um, so the, I suppose the, the first thing that I want to get into on this uh, broadcast is uh, what, what my role, what my desire is for this and where I might see all of this going and how I might hope that it would be of benefit to you. So um, to start with, I myself, I grew up and I, um, I had a really, really wonderful art teacher. Um, and so her name was Wendy Jensen and um, Wendy birthed in me uh, not just the d desire to draw up and paint because that's special in and of itself, but she also always encouraged me and saying, Hey, you can do this. Like, this is something that could be your life. She never said like, you have to do this for a living necessarily. She just said, this is something that could blossom in your life. So as a young boy, when my art teacher said that to me, and uh, I still count Wendy as one of my closest friends today in both life and in the art world, her and her husband, Paul. Um, so fast forward to um, I myself, when I got out of high school, it was a, I, I was faced with this question, uh, this issue, like I wanted to grow in drawing and painting, but I didn't have the ability to do so in that um, the entire art world at that point in time was just, it was immersed in representational, I'm sorry, abstract drawing and painting. Um, I don't want to get into an argument about whether abstract drawing and painting is good or bad or one is right, one is wrong, and all the fights that can come from that. I'm not really interested in that at all. Um, I just really wanted to learn the craft of drawing and painting, what I saw. Um, what I saw was beautiful and in a way for me drawing and painting is not necessarily we don't necessarily draw and paint realistically in order to document things, although it can have that aspect to it. That's not, that's not necessarily bad, but we draw and paint in order to understand. We draw and paint in order to dialogue with the world around us. So the very act of drawing and painting is the, for me, it's almost the, it's the act of dialoguing with my creator. Um, one of the things you'll find out really early on um, in my teaching approach is that everything is infused with my faith. Um, I used to apologize for that more uh, in years past, but as time has gone by, um, I enjoy uh, sharing with people the link between what it is that I believe and how it manifests itself in the visual work that comes from my hands. And I suppose I'm emboldened by everyone from Emily Dickinson with uh, the beautiful metaphors that she would find in her gardens. Um, and how those gardens were for her glimpses at her creator, um, all the way over to the Russian author Dostoevsky, um, who would dig into scriptures and then see how those truths played out on the earthly plane around him with his characters. So I myself, um, I, in graduating from high school and looking around, I had a lot of false starts. I went up to a university. It was a terrible experience um, in that a lot of people were up to some pretty crazy things. I quickly withdrew. I didn't even finish the semester. Returned home quite dejected. And then um, my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, Margaret, of 18 years, 
18 years we've been together. Um, but Margaret said at the time, she said, um, if you could be anything, if you could do anything, if you could go anywhere, what would you do? I was like, well, what would I do or what, you know, what is practical? She's like, what would you do? I was like, well, I think the thing that I would do is I would, I, I would study classical drawing and painting. And in studying classical drawing and painting, I would, um, I would, I would move abroad to Italy, and I would study with the old masters that the, the people who are still linked to the old masters now. Um, it's kind of a crazy thought, in that the I didn't know if any old masters even existed anymore. I didn't know if there was anything that was going on um, that I could participate in. But uh, we were married very young. We boarded the plane and we moved to Italy. And I was able to study at the oldest active atelier in all of Europe, the Charles Cecil Studios in Florence, Italy. And it was there that I was immersed in the tradition that spanned the ages. Um, that is the subject of a long thing itself because it was so wonderful and it was so important in my life. Um, and coming back to the United States, one of the challenges I was faced with was, well, okay, I had this immersion in this other environment, but how do I bring it back to people here? And initially the thought was uh, pretty daunting. It was intimidating because it was like, how do I recreate that studio environment? And then I thought back to my own childhood and the countless hours that were spent uh, sitting at my kitchen table and drawing, the countless hours that I spent um, that I realized was that drawing and painting is something that is accessible to all of us and I wanted to I wanted to offer that to a learning base that was I mean of any age it could be a five-year-old a ten-year-old um, it could be a nine-year-old so um, having gone through multiple iterations having run some rather large teaching studios um, it's very exciting to now connect with students Again, as far as Seattle, as far as uh, India, people reaching out and saying, "Hey, we want to, we want to learn more. We want, we want this to be a part of our world." Um, so, with that, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my immediate life in my painting studio as it is right now. So, I am sitting in a rather large studio. Uh, it's located in a beautiful 18th century chapel, uh, Presbyterian chapel, and. Um, it might be 19th century. They don't know exactly when it was built, uh, but it's a old chapel. It's very beautiful. It's got 17 foot tall ceilings with tall windows, and I'm sitting at a drafting table. Uh, I am curious, though, to know where you're sitting. And that might sound silly. It might sound insincere, but I really mean that, because oftentimes people think to, in order to study drawing and painting, that they need to have this crazy, awesome setup. Um, to which I'll say. I had for most of my childhood just my kitchen table and I would just draw and my brothers and sisters would my brothers and my sister would just be right around me my parents that was my world of drawing and painting um, jumping over to now and my setup that I have it's a nice drafting table it's not that high-end um, I got it used uh, but you don't need that um, you could do everything that you want to do just leaning on you know a flat surface and working away the other thing I wanted to talk about was art supplies so with art supplies it's important to remember that art supplies are can be absolutely simple I mean art supplies can just be the most basic thing that you can imagine so I have right here a simple pencil and I put a pencil extender on it so it lasts a little bit longer but that pencil extender is for me um, it's, it's just, this is just a basic pencil. And then I have a simple eraser. And so with the pencil, with the eraser, I am able to jump into some of the most complex subjects that you might find in drawing and painting. So I'll grab another pencil to show you. Uh, a basic number two pencil is absolutely sufficient for you. Uh, you can do a lot of the things that we're doing for the next few lessons with just this right here. Um, I will eventually be going over and I will be actually talking about the, the materials that I use that are a bit more complex. So I have a huge pencil set in front of me um, and we will we'll be talking about that at later points. But for today, it's important that you just pull out your pencil, pull out your eraser and that you just jump right in. Um, so I will be working today with um, 
I'll be working with a drawing that at first blush is very complex and intimidating. I did that on purpose. The reason why I've done this is because I want you to see that at the core of very complex things is simplicity. So if you saw the drawing that I posted here, um, and you're like, oh, that's not for me. Uh, that's not for my child. That's not for my grandchild. Um, in that it's too complex. Um, that's okay, but it's not um, entirely where I'm going. I actually want to show you that things that are very daunting um, are accessible, even to the youngest of learners. Um, everything that I do on this YouTube channel, uh, this YouTube channel is brand new. Um, it's just, uh, just was created. So um, we have another YouTube channel that um, has a uh, way more users on it. I have some social media channels that have a few thousand followers. Um, not saying that it's anything big, but I chose to start a brand new channel called um, Classical Art Homeschooler with Kevin McAvoy. Um, I chose to start that new channel for a reason, because I want parents of young children to feel as if, to know that they have a safe environment in which uh, all the YouTube videos are curated for their young viewers' eyes. Um, I, my wife and I were very fortunate where we have four children, uh, three older boys and one little girl. And so we homeschool our children. And I, it's very important to me that I know that my children um, are safe in any learning environment that they go into. So everything that is on this channel is curated. Everything that's on this channel is, is good and are things that I would show my, my kids. Um, so with that, um, I think it'd be nice for us to just uh, jump right over to the drawing. Um, quickly, I wanted to say that if you are tuning into this live stream and it's an hour later, if it's five hours later, if it's five weeks later or five months, um, feel free to write in the comments. Um, and I am uh, looking forward to responding to any comments. Again, I think... Uh, as any oak tree begins with an acorn, I think this is going to be something that uh, gradually unfolds. Um, so I look forward to doubling back. So don't feel as if you are out of it just because you didn't catch the live stream live. Um, I will be doing these live streams once a week, which is pretty exciting. Uh, sometimes I will be interspersing them instead of having a live live stream. Um, sometimes I'll just have a pre-recorded video that I upload in the same time slot. Um, the pre-recorded video uh, enables me to do things that uh, are off the grid. So I'll be going deep into the woods near me and I'll be recording myself working on s with some nature journals and things of that sort. So I look forward to that in uh, weeks to come. Um, and uh, I will be releasing um, on this YouTube channel the next uh, streaming date and time. Um, I'll also, if you want to follow me on Instagram and on Facebook, um, I have McAvoy Atelier, Classical Art Homeschooler, um, on those platforms as well. And you can visit me on my website, uh, McAvoyAtelier.com, M-C-E-V-O-Y, Atelier is A-T-E-L-I-E-R.com. And that is where I go in, in a sequential fashion and I go in deeper with all the concepts related in these live streams. So with that, we're going to jump right over and let's start drawing. So the first thing that I do when I look at something that is this complex, um, this fellow, his name is Paul. He's a, he's a wonderful guy. He is someone who I just have a lot of respect for. He works at our local hardware store and I asked him to pose for this drawing. So I did this from life while he sat in front of me. Uh, the first thing I would say though is after you have selected something that's beautiful and meaningful, um, to try to not think of how beautiful and meaningful that thing is. Uh, but instead, um, try to reduce the complexity of this to its most basic geometric essence shape. So when I say geometric essence shape, what I mean is it's a concept that I have um, in, which, in which everything in the universe can be boiled down to the um, geometric idea at the core of every, at the core. So let's just write over here, geometric essence. So geometric essence. So I'm not going to do this one to one, but rather I'm going to go down in size. If I look at the head of this person right here, I don't want to see those eyes that have 
he, he's an Air Force veteran. He has a really cool look in his eyes. He has like a jaw that's like has something like noble and I don't know how to describe it, but there's just something so neat about his jawline and the wrinkles right here. They tell stories. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to, but rather what I want to do is I want to reduce him to the most basic things. So when I look at him, what I see instead of seeing Paul is I see just a basic cube. Now, you may have trouble with a cube even, or you may be more advanced, and a cube might be the easiest thing in the world for you. Um, whatever it is that you, whatever level you are at, um, just know one thing, that these are all things that you can, that you can access um, as, you, as you dig in, um, it, and it becomes sequential. Um, especially on my website, these are things that will become more natural to you. So there is a basic cube right there. Now let's create our light source. Uh, for him, the light source wasn't so much up and above. It was more so uh, from the front. So I'm just going to put a light bulb right over here. Okay. And that light bulb is casting a light on the front of this. Okay. So we can't see the upper plane of the box, but if the light is coming from here, then we know that the lower plane is going to be in shade right here. And we know that the back plane right here, is also going to be in shade. Now we could get a little bit more sophisticated with the light, but I'm not going to get into it too much today. Suffice to say, uh, the light is coming from here. This is the lightest plane. This is the next lightest plane. And then this is the darkest plane. I could have switched it up. It doesn't really matter. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a line down the middle of that cube, just like that. And having put a line down the middle of the cube, I'm then going to break the cube up into thirds like that. So we have now a vertical axis. We have two points and then I'm going to protrude off of here. I'm going to take a triangular box and I'm going to make it come off of here. Now, again, if you're feeling lost at any of these things, uh, that's what the website is for. Don't don't be overwhelmed, uh, because we can we can and will be returning to a lot of these different things. But we have light hitting the front of a box, and then I'm going to shade this over here. And I'm going to shade this lightly. Okay, so let's pan out and look again at uh, Paul's portrait and see what is what's in common here between the two of these. Okay, so we, we, have, we have our light coming and hitting his face directly. We've reduced him to a cube. We've drawn a line down here. We've chosen that we want to see him from a little bit more of an under angle. Um, it's not altogether reeling perfectly back and forth, but that's okay. Um, and then we have brought his nose out here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce his eyeballs to the most basic geometric essence idea of a sphere. And having drawn in that sphere, if the light is coming from this direction, I'm going to shade this over here. So you again might already be looking at this and say, Oh my goodness, like this is way beyond me. Um, that's what the website is for. And all these concepts I are spelled out, I think quite clearly on the website. Like so. Okay. Light is coming from here. Now I'm going to take his mouth and his lips and I'm going to do a little trick. So I'm going to show you a trick for drawing and painting lips. It doesn't work for all things at all times but it works for what I'm doing right now, right here. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more over here and I'm just going to show you the lips right over here. So I call this the inverted triangle trick. So there we just have a basic triangle and then we do a cutaway at that triangle. Like so. So there's our cutaway. And if you want, I'll even zoom in just a little bit more on this. 
So now what I'll do is I'll erase away the top of that triangle. So I've erased that away. And then I'm going to draw a line beneath here. That is the line of the lower lip. So that may not look like much, but I'm going to flesh out this idea a little bit more over here. And you're going to see how this can actually turn into pretty convincing lips right over here. So let's jump back over to our little geometric essence box over here. And let's put in our triangle right in the middle. Like so. And then having done that, let's do that cutaway of the triangle above. Now, this is by no means the way to draw all lips at all times. That would just be absurd. I'm just showing you how lips, there's one way of reducing it to just the most basic geometric essence shape. Now beneath this lip, the upper lip, I'm going to place a dash right here for the lower lip. Now, here's where we can start to develop things a little bit further. And to do so, I'm just going to zoom in ever so slightly more. And I'm going to allow you to see how I can develop this idea. I can roll it over from these lips here. I can develop this idea a little bit more right there. So at the corner of the mouth, I'm going to put these little triangles that are kind of like turned in and on their side. So if you want to see that in greater detail, what you can do is you can zoom out to our little cutaway over here. And there's these triangles on the side. Now, not everyone has these and they're not always the same shapes for every person, but um, they work for what I'm doing right now. So I'm just going to keep on running with it. The next thing, having done this on the lips, is I'm going to return, I'm going to go back up to the nose. And at the base of this triangular box that we drew right here, I'm going to expand out. I'm going to expand the nose out on either side. And that is more or less like the side plane of the nostrils. So you can almost like see the nostrils right there. Very, very simplistic. Um, it's supposed to be. And now the bottom plane of the nose, I'm just going to shade it in. And if you want, sometimes you can change your mind. You could be like, well, I want to make this plane a whole lot darker. I changed my mind and this is now my darkest plane. So it goes, the planes go light, medium, dark. So light, medium, and dark. So you can do that. That's, that's definitely something um, that in the course of a drawing, I will sometimes change. So if light's coming from here and it hits these lips and the lips are protruding, then those lips are going to be in shadow. So I'm just going to give those lips a little bit of shadow right here. They are turned away from the light source. And if light comes from here and if these are turning in, you could put those in shadow as well. So now I'm going to move forward and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in moving forward, I'm going to start to develop the whole idea of the eye. Now, the eyeball, we just started out with a sphere, right? Now let's put almost like a sphere on top of that sphere. So imagine for a moment, draw a line over the eyeball as if it's like almost like an equator or something like that. And then we can double that out 
to put a cap on the eyeball. So new viewers, if you are totally lost right now, and if you're looking at this and you're like, oh my goodness, I am confused. Oh my goodness, I cannot uh, keep up with this. Uh, you can just put your pencil down and you can just enjoy watching it. Um, it's, if it's daunting and intimidating, um, just know that there is a ton of material on the website that precedes all of this by a lot. A ton of really basic introductory material that is very accessible. So um, what I do then is I put the cap on there. So that's the upper eyelid. And then I'll put a, another kind of like sort of like a cap on the bottom eyelid right here. And again, these are just schematics. Um, they don't have to be so exact or anything like that. I leave all my erasures. Um, so it's, you know, you can see like my sloppy work and stuff like that. I don't care. All right. So there you have a sphere within caps. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that right over here. I'm going to build out the sphere on here and I'm going to almost like build caps on it. I'm going to build out the sphere and I'm going to put caps on it. Okay. So if you want to get a little bit more precise with your racing, one of the things that I've picked up in recent days is I have picked up, um, more precise erasers. This is a nice little eraser. Um, these things are available for purchase. Um, if you contact us and through our website, you'll be able to see these things. Um, so I erase away the areas that I'm developing. I'm going to sharpen my pencil a little bit. And that's quite a point on there. I have a little piece of sandpaper. Okay. So I've developed an upper eyelid here. Now I'm going to go on to the lower eyelid. Just gonna turn the corner on that. And it's almost like an egg sitting inside of a cup. And now I'm gonna light it from the side. So oftentimes, more often than not, all of us, as we are out in nature, we are lit from above and to the side by things. Definitely not all the time, but oftentimes. So oftentimes this is the light falling on something. Now I'm going to jump over and I'm going to start to develop uh, the lips a little bit more. So I'm going to bring the lips in. I could have shimmied this out a little bit, but I'm just going to keep the demo very simple and basic. And I'm going to show you how I will push something such as the lips even further so that they match this right. Again, this isn't a one-to-one -one drawing. I'm just showing you the core of it, but I'm going to push this even a little bit further. And there we are. And so I'm going to go in even further on those lips right there. And now I'm going to do something where I start rounding out the shapes here at the center of the lip right here. There's almost like a little sphere and then it turns down at the corners. And there's a little piece of lip right here as well that turns. Okay. So I think that this is becoming somewhat believable. Let me now give him a chin. So for a chin, I'm going to just put like a ball right here, or if you want to give him a cleft chin, 
You can do like two bowls, like so. And then I'm gonna start chopping this box up a little bit. So the box, I'm gonna turn it in this way, and I'm gonna turn it this way. This guy is super symmetrical. So everything I do on the one side, I'm gonna do on the other. Now I'm gonna round the top of his head a little bit. And it turns round like this. So now his head is becoming a little bit rounder. Obviously, I put everything on a flat plane. We don't exactly exist on a flat plane. That's okay. Um, I just, for the geometric essence ideas at the core of this, um, you can see how everything is receiving the same light. Maybe I'll give him a little bit more shade at the base of his nose. Now I want to give him the wrinkles that you might see in the corner of his mouth. Uh, so the wrinkles, I'm sorry, the corner of his nose. And these will come down to the side, like so. And those wrinkles will go down to the side. And so I'm just continuing to keep chopping away. Now I want to put in, let's say, a cavity for the eyebrows, uh, for the eye socket. And so I put in a line at the top and a curve in for the eye socket. At this point, I am getting pretty advanced. Young learners um, are going to be bewildered and they're going to be frustrated at this point. Um, just put your pencil down and really at this point, just kind of like enjoy seeing a demo and know that this is something that over the course of time you'll work towards. So the eyebrow turns in right here. We have like a bit of a cavity here. So I'm going to put that, the plane turns right there. And then we have two bulges at the top of our forehead. I mean, uh, right above our eye sockets, we have two bulges right here. I'm gonna skip all the scientific names. And then at the top of our forehead, we have kind of a bit more of a unified single bulge right there. So I'm just gonna lightly shade all these like very crude schematic ideas just to give a sense of the form. Um, let's go over to the side of the head and I'm going to, the ear sits roughly at the height of the top of the eyebrows and the bottom of the nose. And I'm just going to put in an ear right here. And with that, I more or less have mapped out in a very, very crude way the geometric essence shapes for the model pole that I have worked with. I'm gonna straighten my camera out a little bit. It's gonna take me a minute to do so. So that we can just talk about some of these uh, concepts a little bit more. Um, so again, the break of the plane of the box of the head, of the cube of the head, is right here along the side. We chose to see the whole side of his face, the whole underside of his chin, as just being a square. We turned it like that. The nose was not, we didn't see the round of the nose or anything like that. We just chose to see it as a triangular box that emerged that came off of the plane. The eyes, though our eye sockets are spheres that are embedded in sockets, we kind of simplified that and we just said that they were spheres and we just plopped them right on the top of the plane. The mouth, we started out with a triangle and then we did a cutaway and we kind of inverted the top of that. And then for the bottom lip, we just put in a little dash to indicate the plane change where the front of the lip meets the downward turn beneath the lip. Then we chose as our light source something over and to the side. I changed my mind after a little bit and I made this the light plane, this the medium plane, and this the darkness plane. So jumping over to our model, you could say, well, 
at what point does this start to look like this? Um, it actually can start, you can start out with this in the back of your mind and you can take this and you can place it on top of your subject. And if you use these basic ideas, um, you can get a likeness actually pretty quickly. Now, I'm not saying that that's anything that's simple, but um, I just wanna show you down here how I will use this type of a concept um, to get a viewer, uh, to get a, a subject that's very different in shape. So now let's draw someone. We're gonna do this super, super fast. Let's draw someone with a very wide face. And we're gonna be looking down at them. I'm sorry, uh, we're gonna be looking up from underneath them. Um, so this person, this person is long. This person is wide, okay? We're gonna put in our thirds for the eyebrow line for the bottom of the nose. We'll put in the center line right here. Um, so for the nose, instead of being a long, thin box, let's go with a super wide box right here. What we're doing is in the realm of caricature, but that's fine. So we have a triangular box coming off of here. Then for, we're gonna do our lips. For our lips, let's make that triangle super, super steep. Let's give them really steep lips. We could always extend the box more if we want to. But we have given super steep lips. Now let's invert the triangle right here. So there's our triangle. Here's some side planes right here. The, there are scientific needs for all these things and I'm not gonna bother with that for until we get over to our anatomy classes. Now for the eyes, let's give them really, really wide eyes. Some people, their eyes from the outside look much more ovoid and look much more oval. Then we'll put in some quick eyelids. Like that. I know how silly and absurd this all looks. It looks very crude. But um, I actually think there's something good about working in a very crude fashion um, because it prevents us from getting fussy. All right, so now we're gonna get the line on the outside of the mouth running down from the corner of the nose. Um, I'm gonna chip away at the side of the head to just kind of like turn the head a little bit. Right there. And now that I have that locked in, I'm gonna shade it. I'm going to, this time, let's put the light over here and have the light hitting from this angle. All right, so this is gonna be the lightest part, um, which means that the front plane of the nose is gonna be somewhat dark, like so. The side plane of that eye is going to be in shade. This is going to be somewhat dark. This is going to be somewhat dark. There are formulas for everything that I'm doing and I'm kind of giving you a very abbreviated version. Okay, now I'm going to give some eye sockets. and I'm gonna bury those eyes in shadow. All right, so I may even want to bulge the cheeks out even more. And for that chin, I'm gonna put in a super, super wide chin. I'm gonna to start to shade in the planes of the mouth. Here, go even darker on that lip. And, all right, we're getting to the place. What I wanted you to see is how different these subjects look right here. I mean, they're, they're starting to look like very different sitters. You could say, well, 
neither of these things are really all that compelling. And I would like to do drawings that are much more realistic. But um, as I work with my, part, my portrait sitters, I am constantly thinking of things like this as I approach my subject. And it really actually helps me um, with the realism that I want to do. Um, so it's, it's a very, very, for me, it's a very important way of seeing, seeing anything and everything in nature. So I will finish up this demo by giving him a very wide neck and he's got huge shoulders. So let me show you how these concepts figure in other aspects of drawing um, uh, or in other subjects. So I used all of these concepts in the drawing that I did of my wife and my daughter. So my wife and my daughter right here, um, I chose to see my wife as being a cube seen from the side. And I chose to see my daughter as more of a circle, almost a true sphere. And I used the angular features of my wife's face. I intentionally chose to go with somewhat hard angles against the round features of my daughter's face. So these are all instances in which I use these very concepts in order to I don't want to say exaggerate, but in order to uh, maybe celebrate the differences between the two of them. So I'll give you yet another drawing that I work on, that I've been working on. Um, I worked on this just the other day. And this is a drawing of a fellow by the name of Bob. Um, Bob is sitting for a huge 22 foot wide painting that I'm working on at the moment. And I chose to see Bob's profile as being a cube seen from the side. And next class, I look forward to taking the human head and seeing the profile as a block and some tricks that I've developed through the years in order to see the individual profile of uh, different sitters. So take a look for a moment at how different Bob's profile is to my wife Margaret's. The way that I, I see those differences is by reducing everything to basic, basic triangles and spheres and cubes. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone that, um, to everyone that tuned in today. Um, it was really, it was really nice to, um, to talk about everything. It was really nice to um, share about things that I'm up to myself um, the things that I look forward to you guys um, sharing with me. Again, this is this is um, the first live stream that we've ever had, and in being the first live stream, I'm working through some uh, technical things. Um, I've had a, a few full starts, but um, I am I am excited to show you um, different things, not only just uh, from my studio itself, but also to show you different things um, from trips that I'll be taking and going off into um, into urban environments, going off into nature trails, and to bring you guys with me and to show you how I work on things. Um, I'm going to flip over, uh, lastly, to the McVoy Atelier uh, page where you can see different videos. Um, you can see how we have foundations of drawing, drawing from life, still life drawing, um, I will be uploading my first art history course, which I'm pretty excited for, um, in a few days. And I'll be starting at the Renaissance. Um, I'll be sharing um, all the way from the Renaissance through to Baroque painting and things of that sort. If it doesn't sound exciting, um, I have to be honest, I think you most viewers will find it exciting when they actually understand what was going on in those paintings. Um, everything in these courses is sequential. So if you had any material that you were intimidated by today, um, don't, don't worry about that. Um, and know that everything here is accessible. Um, and everything here are things, these are things that you can work on in your home environment with a number two pencil. Um, I appreciate uh, all of you guys tuning in. I, there's, only, there's only a few of us at the moment, but I look forward to building this up over time. And we'll take it from there.
Thanks so much, guys.